Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of React Roundup. This week, I'm your host, Charles Max Wood, and we have a special guest this week, and that's Patrick. I didn't ask how to say your last name, and I should have. Let me let me take a stab at it, and then you can laugh at me. Stop right. for. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. It's usually, uh, I could say it better. Why don't you go ahead and uh, tell us how to say your name and introduce yourself? So, hey, my name is Patrick Stapfer. Um, I'm an Austrian open source developer uh, working for the Reason Association. We're currently working on the ReasonML platform, and uh, I'm happy to be here and talk a little bit about Reason. Awesome. If you're a front-end developer looking for remote work, then I recommend G2i, a React and React Native-focused hiring platform that will connect you directly with their clients that need your skill set. What makes G2i a unique hiring experience is that they spend the time marketing you to their clients of your choice. G2i is a team of engineers that technically vets you up front. If you pass their vetting, their clients have agreed to skip their initial interview process, saving you time and energy getting your next gig. They take care of all the hard work for you so you can get focused on development. To join G2i, go to g2i.co and apply. Yeah, reason I've so I spent a little time looking at it, but obviously I haven't I haven't like dived deeply into it to see what it is or how people are um, using it or anything like that. But I know that there is some motion or some adoption within Facebook. In fact, I think that's where, it, at least from what I've heard, and you can totally correct this. I'm just going to give you my first impressions. And then, yeah, you can just tell me where I'm wrong. But my my impression is, is that it, it originated at Facebook. It's a functional programming system based on OCaml. A lot of people really like it. Um, it's supposed to be really fast and uh, have a lot of the benefits of functional systems without some of the drawbacks that people run into. Yeah, I mean, I've seen all kinds of stuff built with it all the way down to games, all the way up to just regular websites. So Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Uh, really good summarization of, of this whole thing. So Reason itself is uh, a syntax on top of OCaml. We don't specifically talk too much about OCaml uh, most of the time when, when we at least talk about ReasonML. From our perspective, it's a programming language which um, is especially useful for writing React applications. Mm -hmm. um, it has a lot of uh, nice syntax features like GSX built in, so you don't need any like preprocessing tool chain like Babel. Mm -hmm. Everything is wait. JSX and... is built in. Yeah, JSX is built into the language. <laughs> that and is nice. Yeah, and it's not even coupled to like React. Um, you can use the GSX to compile to any thing you want to. Um, we also have like GSX on the native side if you want to build um, mm -hmm. native applications, um, which is a little bit uh, like more, I, I make air ticks complicated to get into. Um, but theoretically, uh, it's possible to also just uh, use the React model on the native side. Actually, it's also practically useful. So Reason, the syntax uh, was developed by Facebook and the compiler for Reason, which is called BuckleScript, is a fork of the OCaml compiler. And it's implementing a lot of features which are specifically useful for JavaScript development. It adds features which are super cool to map or do interop to existing JavaScript code bases. And this makes it especially useful for like the semantics of OCaml itself uh, map really, really cleanly uh, to the JavaScript world because it also has right. all this you know, um, first uh, first level function support. So mm -hmm. functions as values. And another cool thing which uh, I really like is that it has immutable data structures built in. So when you're trying to um, write structural data, like JavaScript objects in JavaScript, uh, you have immutable records um, on the reason side. That means you don't need any immutability library to have like the advantages of immutable data structures. So nobody can just... Mute, uh, mutate your your uh, your data uh, if you uh -huh. have third party stuff or whatever. And the the coolest part about it, the immutable like immutable records also compile down to plain JavaScript objects. So if I have a record with like a user record with a name and a first name and both are of type string, and uh, you instantiate uh, a value of that, it will just be compiled to your plain JavaScript object as you see it with the name and the first name and nothing else. Interesting. First of all, OCaml has a weird name. I'm just going to say it. It does. Oh, yeah. Um, so why why base this on OCaml? I mean, you, you talked about how it cleanly maps to JavaScript and, and things like that. But yeah, why, why this functional language instead of maybe something else or creating something new like Elm? So uh, OCaml has a 
very long history of uh, having a very stable um, type system. Uh, it has been around for like more than 20 years, but strangely enough, it, it didn't break through in the mainstream uh, space. So mm -hmm. not a lot of people are aware of the language. Now with reason, a lot of people get excited about it because suddenly like the compiler itself is really cool, but uh, you need the ecosystem to support everything you need if you want to do practical work And Buckerscript happened to 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 map really well, like to the goals of Reason itself to write React applications for the web. Back then, like there is there's also another strategy in OCaml where you can take the bytecode of um, of any OCaml program and create a bundle out of that, a JavaScript bundle. Oh, okay. But you had uh, multiple problems with that, like with how do you do this? Um, how do you integrate it with your existing code bases? Because most of the time, you already have an existing code base. And if you can't gradually introduce the technology in there, uh, you have a hard time. That's um, also one of the reasons why TypeScript is um, very successful. People can just drop it in as right. they feel like. And um, with BuckerScript, it's possible to migrate. Like You can have one reason file in your code base And this one reason file will compile to one single JavaScript module. So the file names are one to one. And then you can just import this um, compiled JavaScript file in your existing code base. Uh, there are some, uh, of course, there are some rules you need to obey. For instance, uh, what kind of data structures you use. If you try to use immutable lists, for instance, uh, you need to make sure to compile them, uh, to convert them to arrays whenever you use them in the JavaScript space. Okay. Um, the other way around is easier. Like if you integrate existing JavaScript, like a JavaScript module into your Reason code base, uh, everything can be mapped very easily. Mm -hmm. And there is a, sp a specific external syntax for that. Um, so you can imagine it like uh, in other languages where you have to interrupt with C code or whatever. Uh, you just uh, define an external definition and mm -hmm. uh, give it some properties and define a type for it, and and you're ready to go, and you can just use it. Yeah, that sounds very familiar. If I if you've done things with Node or with like Ruby or Python, you know they have C extendability functionality. That yeah, you just mm -hmm. write those definitions. You, you tell it, okay, you're going to get these arguments. They're going to come in as these structures, and then you just go for it. And so that that all sounds very very familiar. Um, one thing that I'm kind of wondering about here is if, let's say that I'm, I've got a code base and we've been working in it for a while, we're doing the React thing, and I have a look at Reason and I'm thinking, you know what, this could be interesting, but I don't know if this is something that I want to fully adopt. Mm -hmm. is, is there a way to kind of start pulling it in? Because you've said that you can run it you know, side by side. You can build a JavaScript, one module in Reason and have everything else running in JavaScript. Mm -hmm. Or written in JavaScript or TypeScript or whatever. So yeah, is that the best way to go? And how do I know if what I'm building is a good candidate for Reason ML as opposed to TypeScript or something else? So uh, what we usually recommend is never go all in when you try to adopt a new technology. And I guess right. a lot of people are aware of that. The the whole Reason tool chain, as we call it, is like mainly one package. So the only thing you need to do is npm install bs minus platform, and uh, this will install. The, the whole compiler and also the reason syntax and everything you need to get going. The only thing you need to define is um, a BuckerScript configuration file where you can uh, define a path or multiple paths of directories BuckerScript should watch uh, whenever a file is being created in there. You can either use the reason file extension or OCaml extension, whatever flavor you prefer. What we also recommend is like if you have a React application, maybe get the, the official Reason React bindings, which is the, the um, zero-cost interrupt layer in between your Reason application and uh, your React, uh, uh -huh. React library. You just install that and just try building single functional components like without any data fetching or whatever. Just try to build um, a few components in it and, and see if it actually fits in your whole setup. If it is something you feel comfortable with um, adopting and uh, see if your coworkers like it. So it's it's very easy to uh, just try it out. Like in a worst case, um, when you when you when you're working with idiomatic data types, uh, for instance, instead of immutable lists, you use arrays, and instead, yeah, like records already map cleanly to JavaScript objects. So if mm -hmm. you um, if you keep that in mind and 
uh, you compile the code, most of the time the code is really, really readable. They try to advertise it as if it would have been written by a human, but sometimes it doesn't because um, there are some constructs with which do not compile as cleanly to JavaScript. But maybe it's very easy to check it out on the on the Reason Playground uh, just to see what the exposed JavaScript is. Anyways, like if you don't like it and you have some components written in Reason, it's also very easy to eject. Um, like to remove the whole tool chain, just check in the, the JavaScript files and you're done. And you can still like continue with your work and maybe refactor it later. It's not an it's not an all-in thing, but where in comparison, if I would use pure script or Elm, uh, that would be harder because suddenly mm-hmm. you have a whole architecture involved. Uh, you need to adapt first. And with reason you you can just write your plain React components. And then integrate it in your existing code base. Just link it up. Yeah, I found the um, the reason playground, or at least it's uh, reasonml.github.io slash en slash try. Yeah. And, yeah, so uh, just a few words about that. So there's currently multiple um, documentation pages. And uh, we as the, like the reason association, we are like a nonprofit organization trying to improve things. We, we set out and created a new domain, reasonml.org. Uh, uh-huh. where we wanted to unify the most crucial infrastructure of the Reason project, which is the compiler, which is the syntax, like describe the whole syntax. Right. And and also important API documentation, which you need for um, interrupting with the DOM API or, or other stuff. Right now, how it is, like officially, uh, it's separated on multiple websites because these are multiple projects. And the reasonml.github.io is the official Reason manual. Uh, and you also have a playground. Uh, we wanted to improve that as well for the reasonml.org, which should happen somewhere uh, in the first quarter, which is almost at the end, maybe second quarter. Mm-hmm. Then we will also have a, a much more improved playground experience as well. But you can see that if you just on the left-hand side, just insert some reason code, uh, you can also use React stuff in there because the library is already linked up. Uh, okay. You will see the JavaScript output on the right side. And... Yeah, and just just to point it out, because this is audio only, the JavaScript on the right-hand side is really, really easy to follow. Right. It's actually fascinating how cleanly this thing uh, can write out the code. Uh, there are also some really interesting constructs in Reason, which, which I think are like the, the best part about the language. They have some uh, data types which are not available in JavaScript, Yet, Uh I would say, because um, there are a lot of ECMAScript proposals trying to um, get new features in. Uh, For instance, we have pattern matching, which is an incredible feature. Um, Oh, I love pattern matching. I've played uh, a bit in Elixir and such a powerful feature. Yeah, and it's such a simple feature because um, it's one basic thing you need to understand. And then you can apply to um, any arbitrary data structure you have. Mm -hmm. Just to explain a little bit, you can imagine a pattern matching structure like a switch. And in reason, it's called a switch statement. Uh, you insert um, a value inside the switch statement. So switch, uh, parenthesis, my value, parenthesis closed. And then you can uh, have a pipe syntax to match several cases. And the cool thing about it is, like if you put in a record with a certain um, attribute in there, you can pattern match all records which match a name of um, Patrick. So mm-hmm. and you can go arbitrarily uh, arbitrarily deep. Like if you have a list with records, you can also like pattern match on the list, like the first element, yep. which has name Patrick, and then you can go into this case. And the second cool thing about it is the switch statement is actually not a statement but an expression. So each case or each branch of the switch will return a value, and these values need to be of the same type. And you can assign um, this returned value to a binding or a variable if you want to. Uh, which is very powerful if you want to compose things together. Yeah, the the way that I look at it is it's an expression that allows you to evaluate the parts of a structure that you care about, and the Mm -hmm. structures on either side of the expression can be of arbitrary size, and then it will either isolate the parts that you want and give those to you as you tell it to assign them or bind them, or it can just verify that the structure matches. Right. And I, I anyway, it turns out to be a really, really powerful thing. I don't know that it's super easy to explain the concept behind it, 
but it, it makes it really nice when you're dealing with complicated structures or even just things like arrays and stuff as far as, you know, does it contain or um, is this in this spot or any number of things like that. And like I said, Elixir is the one that I've played the most with it in and it does a whole bunch of things. They use pattern matching for all kinds of stuff, including like uh, parameter lists and like you said, switching on, you know, does it match this structure or that structure or have this kind of data in this place or all kinds of stuff. So, yeah. And there's also like this trend in the JavaScript community. Maybe you have heard about XState. XState? Um, XState, yeah. Like um, a lot of people talk about state machines nowadays and how your logic can be expressed as a state machine. So you have a certain state and uh, whenever some action happens, like in Redux, the, the, the state transitions to another state. A lot of people compare that, for instance, if you have a request, uh, what, what states can a request be in? And you have like not asked, you have pending when you already launched a request, but are still waiting for a response. And then you have a success and an error case. So either the data comes back or an error was thrown because of some connection issue or whatever. Right now, how a lot of React developers do that is um, they have a Boolean flag, like mm -hmm. loading or is loading. And then you get some weird rendering behavior. For instance, you get, a, you get a loading animation while you have an error because it's just the way how you construct your program. You have like an if is Boolean, then show the, the, uh, the loading animation. And, and later on, uh, you return other UI and then, and, and then you just missed one case or you expressed your if statement wrongly and you have suddenly uh, like a mixed up state of your UI. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's, hard to, it's hard to explain. Or for instance, you have a search bar and you type in something and you have a type ahead lookup. And while it's doing some requests, it shows the loading, the loading Image. animation or, yeah. Yeah, or whatever. And then there happens an error and it's still loading. It's, it's exactly the same thing. So you can actually um, make it easier for your coworkers to uh, just express uh, like a request and then you pattern match on the result of this uh, request and then they don't miss a case. They are like, okay, if it's success, then do that. If it's an error, then do that. And they don't have to think about, oh, I need to have the is loading Boolean and then I need to check it here with an if. And it's just a, a cleaner way and easier way to express certain situations in your program. So for business logic, this is like a tremendous help. Yep, absolutely. So if somebody were going to start a new project and they're evaluating whether or not to use ReasonML or you know, one of the other options out there that you know, may or may not force you to fully adopt the solution. I mean, you mentioned like Elm is a little bit more, you know, wants to take over your whole project. But if you're starting fresh, then that matters a little bit less because at least because there's no... I have to adapt all this other stuff to it, right? So mm -hmm. if you're in that case, I mean, how, how do you start making that determination? What, what's going to lead people to say, you know, ReasonML is the right answer here? So how do I decide if I need Reason, you mean? Yeah, versus regular JavaScript all the way up through TypeScript or Elm yeah. or something else. Yeah, so um, my personal reason um, why I like this technology is, um, so I've been highly enthusiastic about Gradle type systems. Uh huh. So I've been using, I've been involved in the Flow community for quite some time when it came out. Right. And um, also with TypeScript, I was really happy that static types are more mainstream now. Um, the problem here with credit type systems is that you have a lot of type holes. That means you have the any type, you have the mixed type, you have the unknown typed uh, type. And whenever you're using libraries of third parties, you're never sure what the quality is of certain typings. So mm -hmm. you're like, oh, cool, um, this library has bindings or this uh, library has uh, TypeScript definitions. And then you use it and you get like, promise any. Oh, okay. Or <laughs> returns, yes. you know, you have a lot of just, yeah. or just, oh, it's an object shape. Cool, with keys of string. And then what kind of is it? Is It's any or unknown. And yeah. this is a problem because especially any leaks through your whole code base and you're never sure if your code is actually type checking the correct way. So my reason is, for reason, is that um, it's a fully, a fully typed program. Whenever you write a reason code program, it's fully typed. You need to annotate your types in a way. Um, there is no any, there is no unknown. It sounds a little bit weird. It's, it's, it has all the facilities to cover most cases of any. 
you just need to define it in some way. And most right. of the time you don't even need to define it or like in very concrete cases when you're doing uh, bindings to libraries, uh, you're just very concrete on what data comes back. But in any time, at any point in time, you know what type a value is. And this makes it easier for the compiler to also do um, type inference. So all the type inference is like correct. And with TypeScript, I always had troubles that either you need to annotate everything or mm -hmm. that, yeah, it, it was just not helping a lot with the type inference. Yeah, I mean, it can guess a lot, at least the language service that I've used for TypeScript. It can guess a lot of stuff, even in regular JavaScript. But yeah, you get a lot more bang for your buck if you annotate everything. Yeah. Are you stuck at home climbing the walls when you should be hanging out with the community at the latest conference to get canceled? Are you wondering where to hear your JavaScript heroes like Amy Knight and Douglas Crockford and Chris Heilman? After the cancellations, I decided to put on a JavaScript conference for you online. I invited my favorite folks from around the web and got them to come speak at an online event just for you. Go to jsremoteconf.com and check out our speakers and schedule. The conference is on May 14th and 15th. The call for proposals is open until March 31st. Come join us at an online conference that we guarantee will keep you safe and keep you informed. jsremoteconf.com Most applications I've seen so far written in Reason uh, were related to mission-critical apps. Mm -hmm. um, so last ReasonConf in Europe, 2019, we had one application or one talk about an application which saves lives. Uh, it's, it was a Japanese app for, um, I'm not sure, but it was related to, like if you're a heart patient and you have a stroke, yeah, like it's a stroke mm -hmm. app. And okay. uh, for them, it was super important. Like if someone has a stroke and you need to click a button, there should not be an undefined is not a function error because this can <laughs> you think? cost lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to use React Native still. And, and for that, yeah, they have just better guarantees that your application does the thing you want it to do. And uh, on another point, like in Austria, we have one company called CCA.io. They, mm -hmm. they built an application for the, the Swiss and French railway system. Like when a train passes by a red light, they need to fill out a very, very complicated form. And it has a lot of business logic in there mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of stuff you need to consider. And for that, like the type system maps so cleanly to this that you can express your whole business logic as a huge pattern match. And for this kind of stuff, it's, it's super useful. Uh, another application, a lot of people have complaining to me that TypeScript is getting really slow at some point. Like if you have a medium to large code base, you need, really need to think about how can I build this in a way that it compiles fast. Right. TypeScript has been doing a lot of improvements with definition files and whatnot to, to cache all the types. But then again, it needs to cache everything. And then you have like caching issues with ReasonML and specifically BuckleScript. The compiler has a goal to be very, very fast. And this mm -hmm. is also important for Facebook because you have a huge code base there. Yep. It needs to just like build very, very fast. As far as I could observe it, I never, I could do a cold build every time in less than one second before. Wow. I could just, I don't know, like in my practical projects, like uh -huh. medium sized projects. And I had like um, one client project in TypeScript with a rich text editor, and it took like two minutes to build on a cold build. And this was not acceptable. Like if you have CI processes and you have to wait so long just mm -hmm. uh, to build a mediocre small app. So for that use case, ReasonML is also really shining. So are there any good tutorials or walkthroughs for people to go out and actually try out Reason? There's a lot of content out there from our community. Uh, I would recommend to check out ReasonML.org or like... On the start page of reasonml.org, we have listed all the official resources we are covering. But like the major things like Reason React, uh, the BuckerScript compiler, the ReasonML language are all mm -hmm. documented on reasonml.org. I highly recommend check it out. There's another thing which is very unique. Like ReasonML is a very overlookable language and mm -hmm. the community is also very uh, helpful. We have a Discord channel as well on discord.gg slash reasonml. This is amazing. Like you can drop into the general channel and ask a question if like, just ask, how do I define a type in that way? And there is a response time of less than one minute usually. Like if there are trivial questions, it's 
it's asked really promptly. And uh, the community itself is super welcoming. Uh, this is one ex- aspect I really enjoy. So my nice. recommendation is check out the resources, like try it out on maybe um, an application you already have written, introduce it gradually, or maybe try it out uh, with Next.js. You can just use any like star you want. Maybe not Gatsby, Gatsby is a little bit harder, but uh, in my experience, Next.js is really nice to start off. Just try it out and, and join the Discord. Sounds good. What, what does testing reason look like? So there is, uh, there is bindings um, for chest. So it's called BS minus chest. Yeah, it's, it's the same way as you would uh, use another binding uh, to other libraries. You define your reason file, your test file, and mm-hmm. just use the expect API from the bindings. And it will translate to the same expect code um, in JavaScript. Okay. So you just need to configure chest to pick up your tests. Usually what we do is when you compile the files, you can define if it should compile it inline. That means that the compiled file, for instance, I have a button component in uh, src uh, slash button.re. Then it will compile it to a file called src slash button.bs.js. And that would be the compiled file. Uh, It's right next to your original file that makes it easier to require it and to import it in your existing application or in an index.js file if you want to. It's the same infrastructure as JavaScript has. Now, how does it work with systems like Webpack? What's the tree shaking one that I can't think of at the moment? Rollup? Rollup, yeah. You know, how does it work with those? Do you have to compile using buckle script and then compile again using Webpack? Or yeah. is there a plugin for Webpack that says, go run buckle script and then pull the module in? Yeah, that's an interesting question because uh, someone on Twitter has asked this also. Uh, so this is a question which comes up very often. What we would recommend is we run the BuckleScript compiler side by side. Uh, mm-hmm. It has a very fast watch mode. So you run your compiler next to your rest of your application. The reason why is like Web, Webpack can get also very, very slow. Mm-hmm. Um, if you plug it in with a loader, theoretically, we have a loader for that. But it always made troubles. Like there is, you know, it it forks out a process uh, of Bucket Script, and then uh, there's already a process mm-hmm. existing, and then things get wrong, and there are race conditions. Okay. Bucket Script is really fast, so just drop it somewhere. It, your computer will not overheat of that, and <laughs> uh, <laughs> because yeah, it's just amazing how how hot my computer gets when I run Webpack. Uh, alongside and it compiles TypeScript and and all the other stuff with Babel. Right. So as I said, the the reason file will be compiled to a complementary JavaScript file, and you just use that in Webpack. So when I import a file in my JavaScript, somewhere I have a entry point of my application. For instance, it could be an index.js file, and then I just require my app.bs.js file and Webpack. So you can configure. Uh, Bucket script as well to either compile it to ES6 or compile it to CommonJS right. or UMD format, whatever you want. In case of rollup, you would compile it to ES6, for instance. Every value, every binding you define in a reason module, so every file is a module, it will be automatically exposed as a module.exports value. Okay. So if I define let my component, it will automatically be exported. Sounds good. Now, you also said that you can use this for React Native. Is or, is there any difference using it for React Native as opposed to just React for the web? Or does it compile down to JavaScript that gets run one way or the other? So it is, it is the same way. So we have a small layer, which is called BS minus React minus Native. So it has all the APIs you would expect with the like most components covered. Mm-hmm. And... It would also compile down to to the same JavaScript file you would usually write when you write a React Native application. Makes um, sense. Mostly React components then. But yep. this seemed uh, to work out for many people quite quite well. So, yeah. Nice. Is there anything else that people should know about ReasonML? I mean, either some misconceptions that people have about it or some some, some things that people might think sound scarier than they are or anything like that that would keep them from using it? Uh, so a lot of people expressed concerns when they were asking, like, is it dead? Because it has been around for a while now, mm-hmm. so uh, four years already. 
uh, like since the first thing um, came out. But because people check out the blog uh, on reasonml.github.io and then there was the last blog post of three years ago. The thing is, the ecosystem is quite big. We have the compiler, we have the syntax, mm -hmm. uh, we have specific libraries which are maintained by the community. Not everything is owned by Facebook and it's also not really a Facebook project anymore. It's, it's more a community-driven project already. Now, can I get Don't... some clarification on that real quick? So Reason was started at Facebook. Does Facebook still own the intellectual property or have they handed that off to a community or foundation or something? The Reason syntax is part of Facebook. Okay. So whenever you're using the, the syntax and the parser infrastructure, which is MIT licensed, this is like intellectual property of Facebook. Okay. For the reason React bindings, I think it's also like this. But the rest of the ecosystem, especially the compiler, which is the core piece, is completely open source. It's, li it's living in a completely different organization on GitHub. So this is definitely a good thing, in my mm -hmm. opinion, because it's, yeah. it feels more sustainable anyways, like in the community. Anyways, what I wanted to say is that uh, just because the, the syntax doesn't get any blog posts anymore, it doesn't mean it's not being developed. There has been a lot of great improvements in the ecosystem, especially on the JavaScript side. Like the thing I said about immutable records compiled to JavaScript objects has recently been introduced. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of development. They optimize a lot of code. Uh, the syntax itself doesn't change that much anymore. It has been like this, like the core semantics and the, the core syntax has been there for three years already. And it's quite stable in that regard. So don't get scared by that. We have a very vibrant community and a lot of companies, especially smaller companies, relying on this technology. We as the Reason Association try to, to, to get more like uh, proper community development going. We have fundings from uh, different companies uh, who are relying on the technology. And yeah, it's not only about Facebook, but it's, it's, a, it's a huge project with a lot of people relying on it. That makes sense. And uh, I mean, there's a lot to like about that. I've, I've kind of had conversations about sort of similar setups in other communities. And I've heard rumblings about it in, uh, in some of the communities where, yeah, essentially the core technology is owned and maintained by a large company like Facebook. I'm not going to get too specific because A, I, I don't know all the details and B, I'm not sure how much of it's really public. But um, yeah, it's interesting to see the community kind of take control and go, all right, you know, we're going we're gonna to go and we're going to support this ecosystem and make this work for everybody. And then, yeah, kind of see where things go from there. The other thing that I find interesting is that, as you said, a lot of these companies, what they do is they'll create, say, Reason ML or something like that. And yeah, they maintain control over the intellectual property, but they've licensed it MIT. And so... Um, a lot of people get a little bit weird about, okay, big company A owns uh, technology B. And so if big company A decides that they have blah, blah issue with the community or, you know, they take it in a direction we don't like or this, that, and the other, because it's MIT licensed, it can be forked at that point. And now you have a community already set up to, you know, continue to support the community and however they want to go forward with it. So there are a lot of good things. If people want to get involved in the association, um, and this is something that I would encourage if you care about this community, is that you at least keep tabs on what's going on and know where to contribute. Where do people go for that? So we have a few major projects like our roadmap on mm -hmm. our website, reason-association.org. There is a projects uh, tab. We currently have two active projects. One of them is we wanted to improve the documentation platform. As I said, we wanted to build reasonml.org to finally have one go-to resource for newcomers, for advanced users, uh, to find everything they need and to have up-to-date information. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, have docs which are maintained by the community. So yep. if you don't like it or if something is wrong or, or you just feel like this should be stated differently, it's much, much easier to just make a PR and, and ask on a Discord channel. We have a dedicated channel there to, to ask questions or propose something. This is what, one of our biggest projects right now. And we also work on toolings. Uh, if you're interested in uh, working on uh, development tools, one of them is basically like integrating the, the documentation generation platform of OCaml mm -hmm. because this is like 
we have like a lot of tools in OCaml and ecosystem which not necessarily are compatible with BuckerScript, so they need to be made compatible. So what we do is we 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 extract a lot of uh, like the the doc headers of certain modules. We use um, ODoc for that to extract it, and uh, we wanted to render it to JSON or Markdown. So suddenly we can integrate it in our ReasonML org platform without a much hassle it's a huge next chess application also partly written in reason so if you're interested in that uh, kind of stuff like how to handle metadata about programs and modules this is definitely something you can look in mm-hmm. uh, look into yeah these are like the, the biggest projects we have and we we reckon this will take like at least one and a half years until we get it to a state where we're happy with it uh, but it's already quite quite good so i'm Really happy with the results so far. Nice. Early in my career, I figured out which jobs were worth working at and which ones weren't, mostly by trial and error. I created a system that I used to find jobs and later contracts as a freelancer. If you're looking for a job or trying to figure out where you should go next, then check out my book, The Max Coder's Guide to Finding Your Dream Developer Job. The book walks you through figuring out what you want, vetting companies that meet your criteria, meeting that company's employees, and getting them to recommend you for a job. Don't settle for whoever has listed their job on the job board. Go out and proactively find the job you'll love. Buy the book at devchat.tv slash job book. That's devchat.tv slash job book. All right. Well, I don't know that I have anything else to ask. So let's go ahead and do some picks. Now, usually I have a couple other co-hosts here to shout out some picks and stuff, but uh, things have been a little bit crazy with the coronavirus and stuff. And I don't know if they've, you know, been called into work meetings and stuff. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do some picks and that way you can kind of get the feel for how we do it. And then you can just shout out about whatever the heck you have. I've got a couple of picks. The first one is, is that um, my wife and I have been watching Star Trek Picard on CS, CBS, whatever their app is. I can't remember. It's CBS something or other. And you have to pay for a subscription to get all of the shows. Um, but Picard has been really great. And it kind of got me to the point where I was like, I haven't watched Star Trek The Next Generation in forever. And they keep doing nods back to The Next Generation. So I was like, I'm going to go watch those again. So I'm about two episodes in. And I forgot how good um, the Farpoint encounter was, which is the pilot episode. It's two hours. But I, I, I super love it. So uh, I'm going to pick Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, I believe that it is on CBS. I think it's CBS Interactive is the name of their online system. So you can get it on there. I've been watching it on Hulu, and I don't know why. I think that's just kind of where I wound up stumbling across it. So you can go check it out there. And then, um, yeah, I'm still listening to Chronicles of Narnia on my phone on Audible. And I think I've picked that before, but I'm still really, really enjoying it. So I'm going to pick that. And then finally, I'm putting on the JavaScript JS Remote Conf. So if you're looking for a remote conference that's not going to get canceled because of coronavirus, because, hey, you can't shake hands in a way that spread germs at a remote conference uh, unless you get together in person. I'm I'm not doing it and I'm not making anyone else do it. But if you have a watch party, I guess you can spread the disease. But uh, all the other attendees will be safe from you and you'll be safe from them. And we've got some terrific speakers. Um, We've got Chris Heilman from Microsoft. Doug Crockford's going to come and do a live Q&A. Uh, Amy Knight from the JavaScript Jabber podcast is going to be there speaking. We've got a whole bunch of other folks. I've reached out to a bunch more people. So if if you want just a terrific opportunity to come and interact with folks and learn more about JavaScript, then come join us at jsremoteconf.com. I just added a day because I had so many just terrific speakers that I was like, yeah, you can speak. Yeah, you can speak. Yeah, you can speak. Oh, crap. I filled up a whole day and I have a whole bunch of people who submitted CFPs. So we're going to do it for three days. I'm asking for 75 bucks. If that's too much for you for whatever reason, just let me know and we'll see what we can work out because I'm doing this for the community, but I'm also doing this because I've had a couple of sponsors come to me and essentially say, for the podcasts, come to me and essentially say, we don't know where things are going. And so we're kind of holding off on any spending that we don't have to spend. And I could make the argument as to why that's a bad call. But at the end of the day, I mean, they've got to take care of their folks and I don't blame them for that. So this is kind of a way to carry us through as well. So if you want to support us, that would be great. One other thing to keep an eye out for in April and May, at least, is I'm going to be putting together um, online meetups. And those are going to be completely free, right? We're going to use Crowdcast. You just show up. You can put questions into the Q&A or the chat. We'll run polls during the thing. And anyway, they're going to be awesome. I'm, I've been able to get 
a bunch of people from the community, but I'm being much less picky, picky on those also, you know, it's like, you have something interesting to talk about, I think you'll be okay. And we're just lining them up because that's how I've seen users groups done in the past. But yeah, so keep an eye out for one for React and for React Native, as well as for JavaScript. And yeah, I'm just going to run those. I'm going to do one in the morning uh, mountain time, which is late afternoon in Europe, UTC. Basically, it's like three or four o'clock in the afternoon UTC. And then I'm doing another one in the late afternoon US time. And that's in the morning in Asia. And then it's in the afternoon for the US. And so, yeah, U.S. folks can probably make it to both, but um, it's at a reasonable time for me to put them on and it makes that stuff available because I've had a whole bunch of people, you know, basically sad because their local meetup group isn't getting together and I want to give them something. And afterward, what I'm planning to do, I know I'm rambling, but afterward, what I'm planning to do is just opening up the floor. And if anybody has a question, then we'll essentially allow them to either ask their question in text or actually come on and, you know, ask. And then anybody else who wants to chime in, will bring them on as well onto the screen. And then we can just talk through it and bring anybody else on that has something to say and, you know, and kind of rotate through people and have some conversations and allow people to get to know other people in the community so that we can continue to grow and grow together. And and that's that's important to me, and that's where I think I can make a difference. So that's that's what I've got going on. Patrick, do you have some picks for us? Some things you want to shout out about? No, I didn't think about anything. <laughs> so, have, have you seen any great movies or read any great books? Or I yeah, mean, what's so, your guilty pleasure? It, it could be a beer. I mean, anything. I'm just thinking about resource or like things. I like the books I read uh, lately. <laughs> have mostly been in German. So if you're not a German speaker, this is probably a little bit harder. That's fine. We have a few of those. Go but, ahead. Uh, one, or actually, one book is in English. Uh, one is called Mindset. So, uh-huh. uh, By Carol I Dweck? About, I think so. Like about the, um, like the two different kinds of mindsets mm-hmm. where you have the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. I really, really like that book. Um, it gets me really motivated to learn new things. Especially like this. Especially, we need to stay curious with programming languages. So this is really, this I recommend it. Read if you don't know it yet. Nice. Um, yeah, and uh, there is a there is a thing if you're a German speaker. It's called Die Känguru Chroniken. It means, uh, yeah, it's like a it's a story about a Kleinkünstler, like a small artist, <laughs> mm-hmm. who was living together with a kangaroo, and the kangaroo is a, a socialistic anarchist. And there are kind of weird stories about it. It's like a, it's a really cute thing. Like the the kangaroo does a lot of really annoying uh, stuff, and it's like hundred sketches, uh, like hundred chapters, and uh, it's super super easy to to just stop and go um, if you feel like it. Nice, very cool. If people want to connect with you, where do they find you online? So most of the time, I'm active on Twitter. It's not, yeah, to pronounce it a little bit hard, Rüppe, uh, R-Y-Y-P-P-Y. I hope mm-hmm. I did get that right. And um, with the same name, you can find me on Discord in the Reason Email channel as well. So, and especially if you have any questions about, is this technology something we should use? Or is this, I have an idea how to use it, but I'm not sure. Uh, you can also reach out to me. I'm happy to help and give advice. I'm not trying to convince everyone to, to use it, I'm, but I give healthy advice on if it makes sense. Yeah, so Twitter and Discord is the best place. Awesome. All right. Well, I don't think we have anything else, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. Thanks for coming and, and talking to us. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, folks. We'll have another one later, and in the meantime, Max out. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.